Hi Hobby Friends, let's talk about limited palettes. Did you watch The Dark Crystal when you were a kid? Obviously Jim Henson and his studio put out a lot of childhood defining work and I love them all, but to a little kid with a wandering imagination and world building inclinations, The Dark Crystal really got me. One of those films that embeds itself in your mind and lives there forever. Of course, when I spotted that Broken Toad had teamed up with the Jim Henson company to make some beautiful little Dark Crystal minis, I had to grab one. Urak the Scribe was the chap for me, and he sat on my shelf for a little bit too long, built but just resin grey. I got introduced to the Dark Crystal, and Jim Henson generally, as well as the wonderful world of concept artist and illustrator Brian Froud by my mate, or more specifically his mum and dad. Let's call them Orgra and Ursu. Orgra and Ursu were themselves puppet makers and artists, and they ran a little Saturday club for local kids to make crazy, weird, funny and wonderful puppets and art. There's not necessarily so many places a kid can go to make a huge mess, use way too much hot glue, make up silly stories and oddball characters, and all the while be encouraged and praised for doing so. We were all very lucky to have such a place. Looking back, one thing strikes me as well. While there was a cornucopia of craft paints, glitter, glue, paper, string and a million other things, a lot of the essential stuff, the important bits of what we were building, was very simple. Rubbish, even. Take an empty milk carton, turn it upside down, whack on some eyes, some hair, a bit of old cloth, stick a stick in it and look at that. A puppet. And there is that little bit of narrative thread I needed to get into this Dark Crystal character. Making do with limited means. Obvious really when you look at the film itself, look at all those muted colours and just how limited the gamut is in these shots. A limited palette then, a creative boundary to get the painterly juices flowing. That's the first important why of limited palettes. We may have a beautiful rainbow of colours to choose from in our ever-expanding collection of pigments, but sometimes, a lot of the time actually, a grab bag of choices can end up feeling a little overwhelming. We get a kind of choice paralysis. Artificial limits on our work make us more creative and force us into novel decisions and new lines of thought. So what are these limited palettes really? I mean, on the face of it, it's pretty simple. Just use fewer paints. That makes sense. Just using cyan, magenta and yellow would certainly be a limited palette, and painting with that palette could teach you loads about additive colour mixing. But check this out. This is a simple gamut of the CMY limited palette. To make a gamut, you just join the points on the colour wheel of the colours you're using. It's not an exact match, but it should give you a pretty good indication of the range of hues that's going to be available to you. With something like a CMY limited palette, you have basically everything available to you. Warm colours, cool colours, more or less any hue you'd like except maybe the really saturated reds and blues, it's all there. The limit here isn't really in the palette, it's in your ability to mix. Which is why it's a great exercise, but not what I'm looking for here. What I'm looking for here is a little window that will frame and define my world. I'm looking for a creatively limiting palette, not a technically limiting palette. And here's what I went with. Titanium white, yellow ochre, red oxide and Mars black. Two colours and my tint and shade. Honestly, this palette is kind of crazy. This is what the gamut looks like. It's a riff on the Zorn palette, if you know what that is, but even narrower. It's completely locked in on the warm side of the colour wheel, and both colours are earthy, muted, naturally desaturated tones. I was quite specific about the Mars Black here, because it's the coolest black acrylic I have in my collection. 
It's not going to get us any really cold looks, but it can pull colours just a little in the direction of blue as it shades them down, and I'll take all the help I can get with hue contrast on this. What this palette lacks in scope though, it makes up for in aptness. These are the colours we see when we're in the Uru Mystic's earthy, muted portion of the Dark Crystal world. And that's the other great thing about limiting your palette like this. Just like a cinematographer and editor might colour key a film to give it a really strong sense of location, or a theatrical lighting designer will wash the stage in analogous colours to set a particular mood for a play, so we, as mini painters, can fix a really strong atmosphere for our figures by limiting our paints. Our only job after fixing some colours is to try and get as much out of them as possible. The most contrast in hue, saturation and intensity. As much information as we can. After that, it's all just painting. Were there times in this process I really, really wished I had just one blue, any blue, to deepen some shadows or add a cool rim light? Of course but I stuck to my guns and worked with what I had, trying to stay true to the reference, while also trying to keep as much differentiation between elements as I could. Several times throughout the process, I went in with my airbrush and some mix of black and red, or black and yellow, or even just straight black, and worked it into those shadows. I wanted to maintain the semi-diffused daytime lighting I associate with the Uru scenes in the film, but we always need definition, and this undershading really helped draw out the details in all those rolls of cloth and clothing. I tried to differentiate the stiffer panels of his garb from the cloth robes by sticking to just red and white for the cloth, and building a more complex brown from both my colours for the panels. Later on, I also went in and gave some cloth texture to the robe with some simple hatching over the highlights, but left the panels relatively smooth. The white undershirt got another texture, more stippled and patchy to reinforce the gauzy, aged billowiness of those parts. And you've already seen me work on the rock, focusing yellows on the top with areas of red in the shadows, and all scuffed and buffed all over with a broad, stiff brush. And of course, everyone's favourite way to give definition and neaten up a paint job, black lining. Sending my brush around all those bends and into all those crevices to bring out each element of the mini. The thing about this limited palette is, despite all the restrictions it puts on you, it is in a very real and important sense, freeing. I can't go wrong with my colour choices here, the world is already built for us. We just have to go in and find all its amazing and sometimes surprising details. And here he is, my two colour Urak the Scribe. The world my mates mum and dad made for me and the rest of the kids that went to their club was very little. Just a couple of rooms, a bunch of boxes of crafting material, and a couple of hours a week. But while we were there, building our ridiculous and shambolic puppets, we were completely free. It was a good time, and it will stay with me forever. I could never thank them enough for what they gave us. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next week.